have your Bibles with you, you can open to the book of Jeremiah. If you're using a Bible in the pew, a pew Bible, you can turn to page 823 in the pew Bible. Jeremiah chapter 29 in your pew Bible, page 823. We've been studying the book of Jeremiah, but particularly we've been studying chapter 29, and this morning we find ourselves in verse 8 and 10. Last week we uh, worked on verse 7. This week we are looking at verse 8 and 10. Hear then the word of the Lord, chapter 29, verses 8 to 10. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for your word. And we pray that you would give us understanding. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, today is November, what is it, 15th? 15th. I wish it was October 31st. And the reason is because this year we forgot to celebrate Reformation Sunday, and R.C. Sproul would be shaking his finger at me right now if he were here. So we're going to pretend that this is Reformation Sunday. Um, this would have been the 503rd year anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis on the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, on October 31st, 1500. 17. When A&E, Time Magazine, and the Washington Post compile their list of the most influential people, the 100 most influential people, they list in this order John Gutenberg, who invented the printing press, Isaac Newton and his laws of physics, thank you, Dottie, and Martin Luther King. Martin Luther appears number three on the list of most influential people in the last thousand years. Martin Luther unintentionally launched the Reformation. We sometimes refer to it as the Protestant Reformation with the battle cry, the just shall live by faith. And even though Martin Luther inaugurated the Reformation, there are many men and women through the years, who have lived and died for the principles of the Reformation. And one of them was Lady Jane Grey. Those of you who know your European history and your British history, you will recognize that name. For the rest of us, we have to go to Google and find out who Lady Jane Grey is. On February 10th, 1554, Two days before Lady Jane Grey climbs into the scaffold in order to be beheaded, the Catholic chaplain, the Roman Catholic chaplain, John Feckenheim, enters Jane's cell in the Tower of London in hopes that he is going to save her soul, or so he thinks. As a background, you should know that Lady Jane Grey reluctantly took the throne as the Queen of England and the Queen of Ireland on July 10th, 1553. She had been named heir by Edward VI because Edward VI had no male heirs. And so he appointed Lady Jane Grey as the Queen of England. However, on July 19th, 1553, she left the throne. Her cousin Mary gathered an army of Roman Catholics and supporters to depose the queen. The queen, Lady Jane Grey, 
was a believer, a Christian, a follower of the Bible, and part of the Reformation that was sweeping Europe. So Jane is often remembered by the name the Nine-Day Queen. She only ruled England for nine days. Her cousin, Queen Mary, also known as Bloody Mary, had already signed her cousin's death warrant. And so she sent this Catholic chaplain, John Fickenheim, to woo Jane back to Rome. She was still going to be executed, but Mary thought she at least ought to have a chance to repent and return to the true religion, Roman Catholicism. And so John Fickenheim goes to Jane's cell in the Tower of London. Jane is 17 years old. And a charged debate follows. Fickenheim was a Catholic apologist. Jane was a reformed teenager. And he presses that justification comes by having faith in God and doing good works. That to be a Christian, you had to have faith in God, but you also had to do all these other things. Say the rosary, go to mass, do good works. You had to do all these other things and put together with faith, then you could be saved. Then you could be a Christian. Jane stood her ground. She knew her Bible. She quoted Romans 1, verse 17, the just shall live by faith. Sola fide. He then asserted that the Eucharist, the bread and wine that we have here at communion time, actually turned into the actual body and blood of Jesus. Again, using her Bible, she maintained that the elements merely symbolized the saving work of Jesus. He affirmed that the Roman Catholic Church stood alongside Scripture and that they were both of equal authority. You had to read your Bible, but you must also listen to the Roman Catholic Church. They were equal authorities. Jane insisted that the church sits underneath the Bible, that everything in the Christian's life is subservient to the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. Everything else must submit itself to the Word of God, including the church. They argued for several hours. Beckenheim finally tells Jane, I am sure we will never meet again, <laughs> inferring that she was going to go to hell inferring that she was going to be damned. But Jane turns the warning on him. Truth is, we will never meet again unless God turns your heart towards him and you repent, she said. I will come back to the story of Lady Jane Grey, but let me try to apply what we know about Lady Jane Grey and the rest of her story to the text that we're studying today. In chapter 29, as we've already said, the Jews had been taken captive by the Babylonians, by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. And they had been taken captive because for years, for generations, God had been merciful to them, gracious to them, God had revealed himself to them. God had sent the prophets to give them his word. And the people continued, continued, continued to ignore God and do exactly what God had said they should not do, including worshiping idols. They disregarded God. They took his blessings for granted, and they turned to idolatry. And so God sends Nebuchadnezzar and the army from Babylon to take them captive as a teaching tool. The Lord was disciplining them. Intellectually, they believed in God. But they wanted to believe in God on their terms. They wanted to believe God as they defined God and to live their life according to 
their own standards, not God's standards. But because God loved them, he didn't destroy them. He had them taken captive by the Babylonians in hopes that their misery, their hardship, and their suffering in Babylon would turn their hearts towards him, that they would come to a point saying, I'm desperately in need of God. So now they're in Babylon, and they hate it. Not only is it a foreign land, not only can't they worship in the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had burnt to the ground, but they mock the Jews. And they say, oh, sing us a song of your gods. Sing us a song of Zion. And so it's not surprising that the Jews wanted an easier way of getting back to Jerusalem. It's not surprising. They wanted to find an easy way to being made right with God. And the question ultimately becomes something like this. Will I, will I recognize God's hand at work in what's happened to me? And will I trust my heavenly Father that he has a good purpose even in the midst of my trials, even in the midst of my suffering, that God, although I don't understand it, God has a purpose for all of my sufferings and trials. I trust the hand of God working in my life, and I don't try to find some shortcut around the plan of God. So Jeremiah gives in verse 8 and 10 the people in captivity, a warning and a promise. First, the warning in verse 8 and 9. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not listen to the prophets and diviners among you who deceive you. Don't listen to their dreams. They're prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them. If you go back to chapter 28, you'll see those same words. There are always going to be people around you that you shouldn't listen to. You really shouldn't listen to them. I cannot tell you how many friends of mine I've had sending me YouTube clips before the election of all of these ministers, these people who had visions and dreams of what, what the world was going to be, and they were listening to them. Jeremiah is telling the people in Babylon, the Jews in Babylon, stop listening to them. I will say the same to you. Stop listening to them. In this particular case, there was a prophet named Hananiah, chapter 28 again, who soon after the Jews had de departed to go to Babylon in their captivity, made a bold prediction. According to Je Jeremiah 28, he publicly declared that within two years, the officials in Babylon would return the Jews to their homeland, along with all the gold. And the Jews would no longer be in captivity. And he claimed that he was speaking on behalf of God. Now you can imagine Jeremiah saying, the Lord said 70 years. And Hananiah comes along and says, oh, don't listen to Jeremiah. There's an easier way. It's only going to take two years. You talk about good news that the people wanted to eat up. I mean, after all, 70 years is a long time to be somewhere that you don't want to be. And if you were in that somewhere, or if your loved ones were there in that somewhere that you didn't want to be or they didn't want to be, it would be good news to hear that instead of 70 years being in that place you didn't want to be, it was only going to be two years. That was the seduction of Hananiah, and the people began to listen to it because they had itchy ears. They wanted to hear what made them feel good. A lot of these YouTube things that I referred to earlier prior to the election were talking about tumultuous times are coming, Jesus is going to return, stock up on things, buy guns, blah, 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 blah. In the past years, we've had prosperity preachers. People said, 
Name it and claim it. All of those things are seductive. Do I want Jesus to return? Yes, I do. I really want Jesus to return. I'd be very happy he returned this afternoon. But the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. So stop listening to people who claim they know something close to the day or the hour. They don't know. Take a look at the last part of verse 9. The dreams you encourage them to have. Eugene Peterson, who has a paraphrased version of the Old Testament in this verse, Eugene Peterson's paraphrased of verse 9 says, don't pay attention to the fantasies they keep coming up with to please you. The false prophets want you to believe them. They want you to make Christianity easy for you. If Jesus came back, would it be easy? Yeah. Much like the Babylonians, I think we're in some for some tough times. This COVID is proving it. This is, these are not early, easy days to live in. We're a divided nation. The next four years may not be easy to live with. Do I hope Jesus comes back? Yeah, of course I do. But oftentimes God, like the Babylonians, has us be in a period where we have some hardship as a teaching tool for us. There's only one problem with Hananiah's message. It didn't come from God. God never said it. Hananiah made it up. And people that you live, listen to on, on YouTube about when the Lord's going to return, perhaps they're being sincere. I'm telling you, it didn't come from God. I'm positive of it. I'm positive of it. It didn't come from God. God has made it very clear. His word is in here, the Bible. This is the only revelation that God has given to us of himself outside of creation. This is the revelation of God. Secondly, there's a promise. Verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to you back to this place. Notice the specifics in this promise. You will be there, but only for 70 years. You are going to be there, but it's not going to be forever. It's going to be for 70 years. And the Lord's going to be personally involved. I will come to you, he says. I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise. I will come to you. It comes from God's grace. And the result is God is going to deliver them. And they will, be, they will return to the place they began. They will return to Jerusalem. These are very specific and clear promises that came from God. The only question is whether or not the exiles will fight against God's plan and listen to Hananiah, take the easy road, or listen to God. God's message is this. One, I've not forgotten you. Yes, you'll be there for 70 years, but I've not forgotten you. I will bring you back home. But it's not on your timetable. 70 years, and it will pass. Many will grow old. Many will die in Babylon. And when my purposes are completed, I will bring you home. Now, all of us understand, I think, that God's promises and ours are rarely the same. Or to say it more accurately, we tend to look at life through our own tiny field of vision of what we want, what we think is best, what makes sense to us, what will make us happy, what we want for our children and grandchildren. Our field of vision is like this, because that's all we can see. It's a limited vision. God sees all of this. And so the things that God brings into our lives are not always bad. Indeed, sometimes they can be very, very good. The things in our limited vision are noble things. They really are noble things. What we want for our children, what we want for our grandchildren, what we want for our neighbors, they can be very noble things. But we don't see the big picture. Take a look at verse 10. 
when 70 years are completed for Babylon. That must mean God has a purpose that goes beyond the spiritual training of Israel. Israel was taking a look at it like this. My life, woe is me. Things are so terrible. i got to spend the next 70 years of my life in Babylon. And God says, boys and girls, you can't see out here, but I also have a plan for Babylon. And I'm putting you in Babylon so that you might minister to the people in Babylon. You feel like an exile, but you're living the life God has planned for you. It might not be your plan, but it's his plan. If you're looking for Jesus, you won't find Jesus on the easy road. His way is the way of pain, suffering, rejection, difficulty, loneliness, and death. His death was ultimately on the hard road. He suffered and died in my place. He suffered and died to pay the price for my sins. And he says to me, take up your cross. This week I read an interesting quote from John Piper. John Piper said, the universe exists so that we may live in a way that demonstrates Jesus is more precious than life. The universe exists, and you exist in this universe, so that you may demonstrate that Jesus is more precious than life. When tragedy strikes, when life caves in, when your plans are dashed on the rocks, when you find yourself in a place you never wanted to be, when you experience hardship and suffering that you could never imagine, that's when you discover what you really believe. And just as important, it's when the world discovers what you really believe. On February 7th, 1554, Mary, Queen Mary now, signed a death warrant for her cousin, Lady Jane Grey. Jane was led to the scaffold five days later. In addition to sparring with Beckenheim during those days, Jane spent her final days penning a letter to her sister. And she wrote it inside her Greek New Testament. The Bible at that time was not published widely in English. And so she wrote to her younger sister, Catherine, five days before she is beheaded. These are her words. This is the book, dear sister, of the law of the Lord. It is his testament and last will, which he bequeathed unto us wretches, which shall lead you to the path of eternal joy. And as touching my death, rejoice as I do, good sister, that I shall be delivered of this corruption and put on incorruption. For I am assured that I shall, for losing of my mortal life, win an immortal life. End of quote. On the morning of February 12th, Jane was brought to the wall of the central White Tower. Small crowd had gathered. The executioner was there. To the onlookers, Jane announced, quote, I do not look to be saved by no other means, but only by the mercy of God and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And she knelt, and she began to recite Psalm 51. Have mercy, O God. Search me, O God. Once blindfolded, she couldn't even find her way to the chopping block. She had to scream out for help 
They led her to the chopping block. And the last sound the crowd heard before the ax came across her neck was the prayer from the 17-year-old voice. Lord, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So ended the life of Lady Jane Grey, a teenage martyr standing up for her faith in Jesus. Either God is enough or he isn't. Life is going to throw lots of things at you, and you have to decide, is God enough or do I need more? Either Jesus is more precious than life or he isn't. It's that simple. And so this morning, you need to ask yourself, is Jesus more precious than my life? Is Jesus more precious than all that I have? If I lost everything that I had in the days and weeks, months, years ahead, is Jesus more precious? For Lady Jane Grey, 17 years of age, who stood up for her faith, she stood up for her faith because Jesus was more precious. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. Father, there are so many in our culture that want us to listen to so many different messages some of them even purporting to come from you. And we have itchy ears. We want to hear news that makes us happy. We want to hear news that makes us feel good. Father, help us to be grounded. Help us to be a people who are grounded in your word. We place our faith and trust in you and in your revelation to us in the scriptures. In the days and weeks ahead, Father, we may be tried in ways that we can't even imagine. Father, help us to be a people where our relationship with you, our love for you, is more precious than life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand and as we sing together, my Jesus, I love thee. Four verses. My Jesus, I love thee.